I know a father who has been practicing real love for a while, and he wrote to ask about his two children, ages 10 and 11, who have fairly typical problems for that age, squabbles, anger, misbehaviors. And he was finding it difficult to deal with them with the simple loving and teaching that I had described to him that he's heard in the video chats, that he's read in the parenting book. It just, he tried it, but it just didn't seem to be having a consistent effect. Likely because the loving and teaching was not done consistently. It's rare to never that I see children who don't respond to loving and teaching if it's done consistently. Consistency is everything. Um, being inconsistent with a child is like inconsistently driving on the correct side of the road. Uh, it, it has disastrous effects. Uh, this isn't something you can do most of the time. Uh, love and teach children and then, well, you know, not. So I suggested because it wasn't working and teaching dad wasn't working, some new way of teaching that mm, we might all benefit from. This doesn't alleviate the need for consistency, <laughs> but it's something that can work. I suggested that he identify the gifts of his children, who they really are, what their innate qualities are, the good in them, and then remind them that the rule of the home isn't whoever's bigger wins, um, whoever's louder uh, wins the argument. No, the rule of the house is happiness. That's the goal. The goal is happiness. So anything that doesn't contribute to happy is inconsistent with who you are. These gifts that have been described to you and unavoidably detracts from that. That is why you don't want to do those things. What parents tend to do is say, don't do that, whatever it is that the child is doing, because I said so, or because it's wrong, because it bothers your mother, or whatever. These aren't principles you can take out into the real world and use very well, but it can be very helpful to tell a child, these are the principles that are consistent with who you are. And when you don't behave in ways that are consistent with who you really are, I'll help you see that. Because if you behave in a way that's not you, how could you possibly be happy? That's why we don't do those things, because they're not who you are, not because mom and dad are bigger. We need to teach children to live right because it's happier not because we're the ones in control or the ones in, in who have the authority. He formulated these, this list of gifts and innate characteristics for his daughter. And then over time, um, he'll modify them with time and with her input. So he initially um, proposed these to her. And he put them in as though she were saying them. Now, she's going to have input into changing these for the rest of her life. But in the beginning, when you ask a child what their innate qualities are, very often they don't know. You ask a child, so who are you really? Well, angry. <laughs> it would be natural for a child to say that if they spend... 70% of their day angrily reacting or manipulative or a liar or whatever. Those are just reactions to pain. So we need to help them in the beginning and that's what he's doing here. So he wrote down on a piece of paper, I am, and here are the following qualities. Sensitive, which means I feel things more easily than other people do. I am tender. I have a soft, sweet soul. I feel things more deeply than most people do. So I love to be caring and loving with younger kids and animals. This can be nurtured and developed 
toward friends and all other people. And that's a delightful trait to have. But every gift has a price if you combine it with fear. And we've talked about this before uh, regarding adults. All of our gifts are good. You combine them with fear. It doesn't just neutralize them. It turns them into weapons. So the price for being tender, if I'm afraid, I can be easily hurt. And then I want to get angry or get even. And boy, she understood that immediately. Next quality. I am strong, hardworking, energetic, industrious. See, these are wonderful things for a child to hear, and it delighted her to hear them. But what's the price if you combine this these with fear, or fear or anger or pain? If they're not focused positively with love and responsibility, all of that energy and hardworking and and industriousness can cause a great deal more damage to myself and to others than if I didn't have these qualities. Next quality, I'm honest and I'm sensitive to honesty in other people. Other people can trust me to tell the truth. Well, how could that possibly have a price? Well, it does. It means that sometimes I can be easily manipulated or taken advantage of and hurt because remember she's also a tender person emotionally intelligent i can understand people and help them to understand themselves the good is that i can influence people i can be a leader and a peacemaker but the price of that is that if i'm afraid i can use my emotional intelligence to control and manipulate people Remember, these are all things that he is writing and speaking to her. Fun and funny. I can bring fun into the lives of other people. I can light up a room. The price, I can be mischievous. I can be disruptive and even hurt people. Quality. Determined and persistent, I do not give up easily. The price of that with fear is that I can be domineering and controlling, and people really don't like that. I have a strong desire, new quality, to do the right thing and be a good and loving person. Why? Just because it's the right thing to do. And I have that gift to recognize that. The price of that is that I can be manipulated to feel guilty or obligated. I am all these qualities, and I am amazing. As he read these things to her, she just lit up. And now she has an entirely different perspective on how these good gifts can become corrupted and produce the behaviors that have caused her so much trouble up to this point in her young life. Oh, what if everybody knew this about themselves when they were younger? Think of how they could magnify their gifts and think of the ways that they could avoid allowing fear to corrupt them. Oh, brilliant. The son's gifts, because he did the same thing with his son. I am sensitive, much like his sister. I feel things more easily than other people. Tender. I feel things more deeply than most people, so I can be very loving and caring with others, which is delightful, but the price is I can be easily hurt and feel like a victim. I'm new quality, somewhat dreamy and ethereal. I can just be peaceful and happy in the moment, watching dandelion seeds blow in the wind. Poets have this quality. So do authors, musicians, and so on. It can help me to be imaginative and creative. The price with fear is that it can make me very impractical. Uh, I can get easily distracted and not focus when it's necessary. This was such a blessing for this kid to hear because he'd been told that he just can't pay attention in class. No, when he's not in pain, he does just fine. 
when he's drawing, he does great. When he's in art, he does great. When he's being asked to solve creative problems, he does great. But when he's in pain, like being criticized, like being told he's not paying attention, like being forced to do something that's boring, then he gets distracted and doesn't pay attention. But see, now he understands why. Gift. Inquisitive. I'm good at figuring out how things work and good at improving on things. Combined with that creative, dreamy characteristic, it helps me to be creative, visionary, inventive, ingenious. Designers have this. So do architects, composers, artists. But the price is that it can be isolating if it's not shared. In fact, sometimes it can even annoy people. New quality. I'm great at studying people and learning from them. I'm good at learning new skills, which is cool. The price is I can learn and acquire wrong skills very well, too. New quality. Insightful. I can see and understand why people do things, which is great for loving and accepting people. But the price is that this gift can be used to manipulate people, or I can become judgmental and blame people. Gift. I'm confident. I'm courageous and fearless. I happily take risks in order to find success. But of course, the price of that is that I can be reckless. New gift. I have a strong desire to do the right thing and be a good and loving person, much like his sister, because it's the right thing to do. The benefit of that is enormous moral power, but the price is that I can be manipulated to feel guilty or obligated. I'm loyal and trustworthy, and because of this, I can have deep and lasting friendships. But the price is I can be exploited by people who are not loyal and trustworthy. I'm fun and funny. I can bring fun into the lives of other people, but like his sister, I can be mischievous and hurt people. I am all these things, and all these things create an overall personality and character that is wonderful. I remember, this is the list, this is the father's list of the kid's gifts. Now, he can tell them when they behave unproductively, badly, if you like, that they're just not being themselves, true to themselves. Instead of saying, well, you're being disobedient. Eh, after a while, kids don't pay attention to that much. You're not being true to who you really are. And you're detracting from your own happiness. He can help pull them back to their path, not his. Oh, that's a very powerful thing to teach a child, that you're trying to help them be themselves, instead of you're trying to manipulate them so that they'll be easier for you to control. Huge difference. New subject. A woman in her 20s is looking for a partner. Willingness to learn is the prime characteristic you want. She's writing this, uh, or she's telling me about this. Uh, we're kind of talking about it back and forth. Her present investigation, uh, the person that she's looking at, is emotionally flat. He doesn't express himself much, but he's very clingy and he wants to be with her every second. She asks, what do I do? I don't know what my next move is. Well, as is the next move in most relationships when you're developing them early on, gather information. Lots of it. Read the dating book together. She did. She discovered that he's willing, but not very enthusiastic about it. After reading a passage of the dating book, um, he would say things like, yeah, I, I think I did that once with you when they were talking about getting and protecting behaviors. You know, when it comes to those behaviors, pretty much all of us can say, I did that, or I have done that, and provide examples if we're really looking for them. But I think I might have done that once with you. It's an example of less than full-throated cooperation, 
understanding. Um, he has a possible intellectual realization of which, what they're reading, but she can see that he has no emotional involvement. He invited her to a weekend with him and his family, which is a great opportunity to observe him, but it's also kind of a skewed opportunity. He'd be around the people who made him who he is. So what do you really learn? I didn't suggest that she go or don't go. She said, I decided not to go with Mark to meet his family this past weekend. There was a real love gathering in town, so I spent every moment possible with him whenever he was available. I just, uh, meaning with the real love group, sorry, every moment possible with them whenever they were available. I just love spending time with real love people. It really is a different experience being around people who understand what genuine happiness is. She continues, I didn't see Mark for almost two weeks. He texted me almost every day and invited me to pretty much everything. He would say, my friends and I are doing this. Can you come? He's pretty clingy. And I said no to everything because I had other things going on. But tonight I decided I would go and read more of the book with him, like you had suggested before. That's how you learn about him. Any guy who professes an interest in you, who doesn't have the time to read a book about relationships with you, probably isn't a guy you want to stay with for the rest of your life. His simply wanting to be with you means very little. Who wouldn't want to be with you? His willingness to learn is everything. You continue. I already knew that Mark was emotionally empty emotionally numb, kind of clueless, stuck in his head, quite a lot like a little boy. What I'm not sure of is how to gauge his willingness to learn real love. How can I tell? We read chapter three in the dating book tonight, and he even admitted while reading the clingy and running examples that you listed, he said, oh, um, I've done that. That's actually a pretty good sign. He even looked at me once and said, sorry if I've done this to you. Uh, he seems somewhat able to tell the truth about himself, unlike most people that I've dated, but that doesn't mean he's willing to change his actions or even knows how to change them. I need some guidance here as to what to do now that I'm dating this guy more and more. His cleanliness is repulsive to me. He reached out and put his arm around my shoulder a couple of times tonight, and I didn't like it at all. Practically hated every moment of it. As I was leaving, he said, I'm free Friday if you want to do something. What matters is, but there are a couple of things. If his clinginess is repulsive, and I happen to know that you do like to be touched, it might be a clue that you're not entirely attracted to. Uh, and when he tells the truth about his cleanliness, can you feel anything from him? Or is he just intellectually understanding it? Do you ever really feel who he is? And she wrote back in a separate email and said, I don't ever really get feelings from him, just intellectual discussions. You continue, I don't know what to do now. Do I keep reading the book with him when I'm available to? He seems to like reading the book, but I think he needs to do his own work in real love in order for any relationship between him and I to work out. How do I tell him this? Easy. You ask him, or just ask yourself, has he done any? Remember, he's professed an interest to be with you every day. He says that he wants to develop a relationship with you. He is willing to read a real love book when he's with you and to read as long as you've got the book sitting open on your lap. But has he done any real love reading on his own? If I were eagerly, fervently interested in dating somebody and they said the most fascinating subject in the world was cattle, I'd read a book or two on cattle without being asked to. Uh, this would be a huge indication of his willingness to learn. Has he been to the website? Has he watched the video chats? 
that you talk about. You see what I'm asking? He's willing to do stuff with you because he's lonely and because you're fun to be with. Well, who wouldn't want to spend time with you? Uh, there are any number of neighborhood dogs who would be happy to spend time with you, but you're not going to make them your partner because they don't have the characteristic of being willing to learn to love you unconditionally. His real willingness will be demonstrated by his eagerness to learn more. Do you see that? That's the question. It's an important question for all of us. And it turns out that n no, he had he demonstrated no interest ever uh, in learning about real love on his own, N had never been to the website, had never seen a video chat, had never done any of this stuff. He was reading the book only so he could get her to like him. I'm going to emphasize this point because I hear this kind of question almost every other day. How do I know if this guy is really interested in learning about the thing that's going to make our relationship work? Does he study it on his own? No, never. Well, that's a pretty good indication. Uh, it's like somebody saying, I really want to do well in school. Uh, and the only time they study is in the study hall when they won't let you out until you've studied. Well, that person's not really interested in doing well in school. So it turns out that this guy never really showed any interest on his own in learning about unconditional love ever. Uh, and so she told him goodbye and poof, he was gone. Uh, he moved on to the next person who would be easier uh, to secure as a companion, would require less effort. You can always find somebody who's easier. New subject. 30 year old woman was recalling when she was a child, she was recalling to me that uh, as a child, her father would yell and yell at her. And she said an interesting thing that I found interesting enough to pull a three by five card out of my pocket and write down. She said, I really wished that he would just hit me. Pay attention. Verbal abuse is every bit as bad as physical. It more directly assaults the soul. It lasts longer. It's more renewable. You can assault the soul, soul over and over and over again and leave no bruises, and the police don't come and take you to jail. It's less visible, so we're more puzzled at our pain, whereas bruises have an obvious cause. In fact, some of the most damaged people I've ever seen are people who've never been hit, ever, uh, never been sexually abused. There's never been any obviously traumatic event. I got a letter from a lady an hour ago who was just telling me how she was raised. Well, I happen to know her father. And she was just simply emotionally not nourished all of her life and ended up on antidepressants her entire life and tried to kill herself several times. And it has a terrible effect on how we do. So... It makes sense that this woman said, I really wish that he would just hit me because then there would be an obvious cause for her pain. Emotional pain can be pretty mysterious to us. New subject. I know a woman who visits her 85 year old aunt and the aunt complains apparently endlessly about everything and everybody. You walk in, she starts complaining. She complains the whole time she's there. She complains as you're leaving. The lady who visits the aunt, the lady I know, says, I feel like I should go visit my aunt. What can I do about this? I said, touch her, look her in the eyes. If you touch her and look her in the eyes, she'll stop talking because she'll realize that you're about to say something important. And you say, I'm right here with you. You have a choice. Now, tone of voice really matters. I'm right here with you. You have a choice. You can enjoy the fact that I'm here with you, enjoying your company. You can enjoy mine, or you can complain about the past, which has never made you happy. Now, 
you're not making her learn the principles of real love. You're just simply making it obvious that you're not interested in complaining uh, about the past. And if she'd like you to keep visiting her, mm, that practice is pretty much going to have to stop. You're going to get to just flat enjoy each other. Gee, that's just a shame. Um, you really don't have to keep visiting somebody who endlessly moans and complains and empties out your soul. New subject. I arranged a Skype call with a guy, but he texted to say that he'd be late, and then he wrote to explain. He said there was an unusually long line uh, for uh, tickets on the Metro this morning. I was with the kids. We were on time to the Metro. Uh, in fact, we were 15 minutes early until we hit this big, long line. The lady in front of us was just huffing and puffing impatiently about how she was having to wait. And the student behind us said to nobody in particular, this is just effing ridiculous. And they always choose today, the first Monday of the month, to be checking tickets. Now, referring to ticket inspectors, I'm not familiar with the process of how they do this on this particular train. But anyway, everybody in line was complaining. So he continues as he writes to me. I filtered through my possible responses. I could say nothing and quietly judge him. Um, no, nah, I decided not to do that. Number two, I could choose to be annoyed that he's swearing in front of my kids. Because remember, he said I it's something about this. This is effing ridiculous. And I decided, no, nah, that probably wasn't going to go well. Third, I could point out that he's being a victim that he could have renewed his ticket yesterday or gotten up earlier and that, of course, they're going to check tickets on the first of the month, as he noted, that they always do and that, there's, and that that's just their job. And then I decided, nah, that probably wasn't going to work either. Because <laughs> notice, all, one of these involves inaction and two of them involve correcting the guy behind him. No, neither of these is going to work. So he continues. I said, you know, I could have done this yesterday. Gotten my, apparently it's some process of having your ticket inspected and stamped for the month or I don't know. He said, I could have done this yesterday. Pfft, I wish I had. And the guy behind me who had just gotten through cursing said, yeah, me too. And avoided the line outstanding. You communicated something to the person behind you by using yourself as an example. The lady in front of me stopped huffing and puffing and said, you know, I thought the same thing last month, that I would do it differently this month, but I didn't. I've never heard this term, but it seems to apply here. This is infectious responsibility. <laughs> I smiled and turned and said to my son, can you try to remember to remind me next month? He smiled. And then I said, well, all the machines are working, so it's moving, and I'm glad. I felt content. I was late. Uh, I missed our call, the call that he'd set up with me, but I was content. The kids were peaceful. They weren't moaning, and the people around me in line had stopped grumbling. Not just the person ahead of me and the one behind me, but people all around me stopped grumbling as the word passed, aren't we stupid that we didn't do this process before the first Monday of the month when apparently there's always a long line to have this process done. He concludes, be grateful, add love. It's simple. <sighs> I'm impressed. Freaked out, actually. Very cool. Here's a man who writes, new subject. My wife and I are talking about the, the time that our daughter, Lisa, 14, is allowed to use her iPod on weekends. Lisa accepts the limits that we've proposed for weekdays, but she feels that she doesn't want limits imposed on the weekends. Well, pff, duh. What child wants limits? Of course she doesn't. But one you're entertaining the possibility of allowing her to make a decision parents make. I can hear it that that's what you're entertaining. And two, 
Every study on earth proves that the more electronics time a child has tends to lead to dissociation from other people, social awkwardness, hyperreactivity to the people around them, isolation, unhappiness, addiction, and more. That's every study. There isn't a single study that says the more that children use electronics, the better educated they are. The calmer they are, the more they interact with other people, the more obedient, the more helpful they are around the house, um, the more social they are, not one. You'd think that we would learn from that, but we're not. Children are being given just unfettered access to electronics. Dad continues, she likes to listen to music to go to sleep. A ch an adolescent child who likes to listen to music, how shocking. Just because she likes something, pay attention, every parent, is not a reason to allow it. But listen to this father. He's going to allow his child, or you can hear that he's leaning toward it, Listen, allow his child to listen to electronics to go to sleep because she likes it. Well, if we gave our children what they liked, then they would uh, eat ice cream, watch television or electronics all day long and wouldn't go to school. That's why there's like a law that they have to go to school. It's become a standard belief among parents. Don't make little Lisa unhappy because then she'll be mad. No kidding. Almost every parent makes their decisions in that way. And I deal with parents who make decisions in that way literally every day. I know I should say this to my child, but they'll be angry. Um, then you're doomed. And besides, everybody is doing it, the parents say. What harm could it do? We are afraid of our children. It's horrifying. For Lisa, having her iPod has become a habit. It's like a pacifier or soother or dummy or it goes by different names in different cultures. The thing that little, the little rubber thing that children suck on instead of a bottle. Electronics have become like a pacifier for kids. I've talked to a number of adults now who cannot sleep. Actually, they can't sit still without some kind of distraction. And this isn't good for them. They require distraction all the time. Some people require loud music to go to sleep, and they're willing to keep their partners awake. Unbelievable, but true. This father says, I've read online materials uh, that say that children use uh, electronics to replace face-to-face -face communication. Duh, they really do say that. But then the father continues, but she doesn't do that. And my immediate answer is, well, excuse me, but how would you know? Really? You, you have a study of one child who's on her electronics all the time. How do you know that if she had no electronics, she wouldn't have more face-to-face -face communication? You don't. You have no idea how much more communicative and social she would be or cooperative she would be in doing things around the home. You simply do not. Saying, oh, she doesn't do that. It doesn't affect her is only a justification to allow her to do what she likes so that she won't be angry at you. Parents really don't like hearing this, but it's true. So your last statement is completely unsupportive unsupported, while the studies prove that what you said is highly unlikely. You continue, but she doesn't have a smartphone and does go out to see her friends on weekends. Well, good, but you have no idea the effect that the iPod has on her emotional well-being. Well None, whereas all the studies say that it affects the kids adversely. And it is a smartphone. You just said she doesn't have a smartphone. Well, but it is. It, it's an iPad because she can use the internet to FaceTime people. So that makes it what we call, hang on, a phone. So sure, not quite a full smartphone, but it's still a phone. You would be wise to recognize that. And I recognize it only because I've heard all of these rationalizations and then some. 
You continue, my wife wants to impose a limit of three hours a day on weekends. Uh, three hours a day of electronics time. That's pretty liberal. Uh, Father says, I understand the need for limits. However, I think we need also to allow time without limits set by us and controlled and policed by us. In other words, I think she should be allowed to limit her own time. Well, that's up to you, but I can tell you that it would be highly unwise. Um, kind of like letting children decide how much school they'll go to or how much ice cream they'll eat, the example that I used earlier. And when the effects become more pronounced of her electronic shoes, like complete and utter isolation, when it includes sexting, when it becomes addictive, you'll find yourself far, far behind where you are now. Now you'll be in trouble and you're going to find it's much more difficult to get a child to limit their electronics use when you've let it go on for years. This is not an opinion. It's the advice from an expert, from me. I've seen this happen with thousands of kids and it's the opinion of now hundreds and hundreds of studies. The father says we would have to police uh, the three hours on the weekend uh, if we imposed limits, and that would be difficult and it would lead to conflict. Well, that would be a shame, having parents who actually have to monitor what their children do, like as in know where they are and what they're doing. Isn't that what parents are supposed to be doing anyway? It's not called policing when you know what your children are doing and where they are. It's called pause parenting. Father, the father continues, I proposed a different solution that should have the effect of self-limiting the amount of time she spends on the iPod. I suggest that we have her read books more. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't keep a straight face and read that. And she says that she doesn't really like reading. I think this is a shame. So, <laughs> She already hates reading, and you're going to propose reading uh, instead of the iPod. If you require reading, are you saying that that wouldn't lead to the dreaded conflict that you mentioned? Well, it's guaranteed to. Of course it would. You can't avoid her disapproval if you want to help her to become a healthy adult. It is not possible to raise a child and avoid a child's disapproval. Otherwise, we would let them go to bed when they want. We'd let them eat what they want. We'd let them go to school when they felt like it. We'd let them do whatever they want to do because children will disapprove of some of the things that are best for them. That's just unavoidable. Look what happened with the two older children. Now I'm talking to the father directly because I happen to know the two older children where you avoided conflict and didn't carefully love and teach them. And now he's having to deal with kids who in one case won't speak to him at all. And in the other case, barely speaks to him even then only on occasion. So in the process of avoiding conflict with the two older kids, he got disaster, and now here he is again with the third child, avoiding conflict. Pretty much he just wants to avoid responsibility. And this is the parent. The parent says, I propose that she be allowed to go on her iPod as much as she wants each day. All I can think of is eat all the ice cream you want. Um, and at the weekend, the only rule is that she reads a book for as long as she uses her iPod each day. So now I'm trying not to laugh really hard. This is going to require just as much policing, which you said you would really hate to do, uh, as you said would be required for the iPod limits. Now you will have double policing. You will have to police and monitor the time of the iPod and the book reading. This is going to become insanely difficult. Uh, I can actually tell you it's going to become utterly impossible. The father says, the advantage of this is that then she will limit herself. <laughs> That'd be like telling a child, you can eat as much ice cream by weight 
uh, as you eat broccoli. You think a child isn't going to find a way around that? <laughs> the child will load uh, tables full of broccoli on the table. And as soon as you've gone away, the child is going to bring in a goat from the neighbors <laughs> to eat all the broccoli <laughs> and then eat ice cream herself. You're deluded. You already said that she doesn't like to read. You think that now that she, that now she will suddenly like to? You continue. So at the same time that she limits her iPod um, use, she will read more. She may well, this sounds almost like a fairy tale, she may well get hooked on a book. <laughs> She's more likely to get, you know, hooked by a sharp object as she runs to the train station late, like the man was talking about earlier. She may get hooked on a book and spend more time reading and in time learn to love reading as well. She might, but that's quite a supposition. She might much more likely benefit from no iPod at all. Really, if you're having this much trouble with the iPod now, it's much easier to go to no iPod than to limit the use of it. I've read biographies by the hundreds, more than anybody that I know. And the people who did get hooked on books, the people who became highly successful in life, um, didn't have access to electronics, pay attention, at all. No electronics. So if you really want to teach her, if you're really committed, as you say you are, then you'd eliminate the iPod altogether. There isn't a single study that shows that electronics benefit kids, except for using a computer to do homework only and to do research on the computer. That's it. You'd be flying in the face of all this evidence. Father concludes, we won't need to police this, as it will be obvious when she hasn't read and when she has. We will notice if she reads for three hours in a day. No, actually, you won't, because you're still going to have to police her, just like you dread policing her with the iPod. You won't just notice if she's read for three hours. Um, policing with the iPod for time is actually easier. There are apps that do that. And to police reading, impossible possible. I already know your mind. You're imagining that, it, that at the end of the day, you're going to ask the child what the plot summary was for the book. She can download reviews on books by the hundreds and completely fool you into believing that she's reading the book. And then she'll be on her iPod all day long. The plan that you have is absolutely guaranteed to fail. And parents need to, to listen about this because it applies to a lot of things. Um, uh, smartphone use, iPod use, uh, they don't police themselves. And the more a child is allowed to use electronics, the less connection they form with other people. That's where happiness is. Not one study says happiness is linked to electronics use. There was a study done oh, many years ago called the Valent study, and it finally was released two or three years ago. And they studied a group of men for 74 years. And after following for 74 years and following their socioeconomic status, uh, many of them were involved in world wars, uh, following every variable that they could. At the end of the study, George Valant summarized the study and said this, happiness is love. Full stop. That's what he said. He didn't mention electronics at all. Nowhere. New subject. This is from a lifelong victim. Uh, it's been quite a struggle for this victim. She said, I'm learning a lot more about my victimhood. At a deeper level of understanding, I'm learning that my husband is not my enemy. Hallelujah. I don't need to protect myself from him or punish him for not loving me perfectly. I'm very fortunate that he wants to grow and help me grow and overcome my pain. Oh, bless you. It's lovely to hear. He really is not your enemy. On occasion, he may not understand you or even demonstrate what love he has in the moment, but that's only from fear or ignorance, not because he's your enemy. 
You continue, other people are not causing my pain. It's me. I am causing my pain by choosing to believe that other people are hurting me. Partly. But in your defense, you were taught to do this. And in your childhood, you really were hurt. And you continue to carry that pain with you now into adulthood. You continue, victimhood is often a knee-jerk reaction. I was trained to have a victim thought, but I can choose now to throw it out. This became even more clear to me this morning when the bank sent a bunch of paperwork to fill out. My first thought was, oh, great. So now I have to do loads more administrative work because they chose to change some stuff. Then I chose to laugh at myself and see the value in the way my husband views it. He just did the paperwork. He didn't waste all of the time or ruin his happiness by complaining about it. He just did it. Here I've been viewing him as the enemy because he's so different from me. And it turns out that his being different from me is very productive in many areas. Honey, you're lucky to have him and his attitude. Victims find something wrong with everything. And here you've learned to set it aside. Overcoming victim thoughts. Once I've entertained a few, this is you continuing, is like, sorry, this is, uh, I'm going to check here. Ah, this is me, not you. Overcoming victim thoughts. Once I've entertained a few is like running up a very steep hill with a heavy backpack on. I have to work really hard to regain my peace. And sometimes I think I don't have the energy. It's easier to wallow in my victimhood, but I no longer actively choose to do that. I now choose to see the truth, to get what I need, to tell the truth about my behavior and the lies that I was believing. I choose to do the work no matter how hard it feels. I apologize to those I just read to that whole section where I said that was me. That was her. I just put the wrong heading. So she's the one that recognizes that it's like climbing a hill with a heavy backpack on. And now she no longer has to choose. To, she doesn't have to be a victim. She can choose to do a work, can choose to do the work. That was her, not me. My mistake. She continues. I tend to believe the thoughts that being a victim makes me bad, especially bad. This is one which my husband is helping me to see in the moment. If I can head this one off, then I don't go down the everyone would be better if I was dead route of thinking. I often choose to feel victimized by my victimhood. <laughs> my victimhood is born of low self-worth, feeling powerless or feeling trapped, I choose to feel, feel victimized by others in an attempt to control them and to make me feel more safe. I look to put, uh, I look to other people for the illusion of safety instead of where true safety is found with the people who love me. I'm only ever one thought away from misery and pain or freedom and joy. I need to always choose wisely. That was quite a monologue uh, from her, but it was such a good summary of victimhood that I just couldn't resist. Victimhood is taking over the world. Every magazine, every newspaper that I pick up, it's all about victimhood. Um, you turn on the news and the news people have learned that their job really isn't to report news. Their job is to get people's attention. And they do it with victimhood better than anything else. It can ruin an entire workplace or classroom or family or any other group. New subject. I know a woman, uh, Celia, whose marriage ended many years ago. And she had become estranged from her three adult children over the years. Her ex, Christopher, was a very angry man. Hence the divorce. And he caused a great deal of damage to the kids with that, hurting them personally and poisoning them against their mother. He has kept them around him, so they stay with him rather than her, only by helping them financially, fairly often. 
by giving them gifts, by supporting them. But even that isn't working anymore. They're in their 30s because he's still angry, unkind, and they're sick of it. Christopher, the ex, read the real love book and agreed that being loving is the way to go. He found it very interesting, the real love book, which makes me smile, so do most people. But so what? Agreeing with it in principle and practicing it are very different. Example, everybody agrees with the concept of world peace, but then they honk and scream at the driver ahead of them who was stupid. That and billions of incidents like it per day is what prevents world peace, not the failures of political machines. So it's one thing to find a principle interesting, it's quite another to live it. So Christopher, the ex, wrote to Celia about his relationship with the two kids, with two of, it, with, with two of the kids. Uh, now remember, Christopher's the ex, and Christopher and the lady who's writing this, uh, who wrote to me, uh, have been divorced for a long time. So Christopher said, I agree that anger is not the best way to do things, but sometimes people are just so inconsiderate that it's unavoidable. So notice, the principles of real love are interesting to him, and love is good, but only when loving is convenient for who? For him. He said, the kids often fail to return my texts, and they avoid being around me and Ruth, who's his present wife. Unfortunately, it sounds so far like Christopher was interested in learning something new, but it's just another intellectual exercise for him. His world is still limited to just him. So he can't disturb that world with anything that would involve change. He can't stop himself from defending himself. And here he is attacking his own children and then wondering why they don't want to be around him. He said, I spoke to child number one. The child's name is obviously not number one, but it was easier than giving you 12 kids' names. He said, I spoke to child one this evening. He told me that he wished child two a happy birthday and didn't get a response back. Also, he reached out to child three for something, and he too did not respond. I'm concerned with this escalation of anger or indifference or all-around hurt that is occurring among the children. I believe that families should be more forgiving toward each other. Now, remember, I'm getting all of this from the mother, from the ex-wife of Christopher, who was abused by his anger and watched him abuse his children with his anger all their lives. But he believes that families should be more forgiving toward each other when it's convenient to him. Notice, of course, that Christopher takes no responsibility for having taught the kids to hold grudges, which he modeled for them all their lives. And of course, he, and of course he believes in forgiveness. It would be his favorite thing for other people. Why? Because he's angry all the time. And then he wants their forgiveness of him. But he never forgives anybody for anything they do. Being angry at people is like smashing them in the face with a shovel and then expecting them to smile in response. And he really does that with his own children often. He expects their forgiveness in part because he pays them money. So he gives them money instead of love, and then he's hateful to them and expects them to forgive him because, well, you know, he's paid them. Um, this is Christopher now, continuing his email to, to his ex-wife. The kids don't respond to my texts either. <laughs> Surprise. And I think that they may believe that they're teaching me a lesson. But if you get the chance to speak to them, I think you should caution them. Notice again, like with all selfish people, that Christopher wants to make his own choices and be selfish and then have other people clean up his messes. He wants them to forgive. He wants them to respond to him. And then he wants you, his ex-wife, to talk to them. He isn't taking any responsibility at all. I strongly recommend, you can do what you wish, don't do it. Don't get involved. Do not start advocating for him with the kids. Just love your children.
and don't get between Christopher and them. There's no win in it. He continues his email to her. I believe that we cannot allow this disharmony to go on too long, even though, of course, he's been doing it for, you know, three decades. Or it never really resolves. For example, in the future, what if I displease them, the children? Uh, they can alienate me from my grandchildren. Well, then I'm going to have to be very cautious in establishing a relationship with the grandchildren and with them. Notice that he cares nothing about his own behavior. He cares nothing about his own hatred and the way he treats the kids. He only cares about how people treat him. And he's concerned only that you fix the consequences of his anger so that he doesn't lose contact with his grandchildren. Grandchildren he thinks he will own as he has done with his children. He bought off the first generation, but now that's wearing off. So he wants to buy off the grandchildren. And he's most afraid that the children will make it so that he can't buy off his grandchildren. If his children did alienate their children from him, he would punish them financially in his will or however, or if they ever hurt him in any way. So this is a very vindictive man. This is what he's saying that he will punish anybody who doesn't do things his way. It's all about him, him, him. He cares nothing about anybody else. He continues in his email, the grandchildren cannot be pawns in our lives. So in other words, he takes responsibility for absolutely nothing. He's absolutely using the grandchildren as pawns. Um, he used, but he, see, he uses the grandchildren as pawns in his game. He just doesn't want anybody to use them in their game. He continues, the boys, two of the kids, have recently avoided me, and the other child has been doing this for a long time. I want to see an immediate improvement. Now, remember, he's saying this to his ex-wife as though somehow she has a responsibility to create a good relationship between her children and her ex-husband. This man really believes that he can order, obedience, and harmony in his adult children. Now I'm speaking to the woman who's writing to me. Don't respond to this email. Don't do it. You just love your children. Don't get in the middle. He continues, perhaps your experience and contact with those, those people in real love might offer them some help. But I refuse to participate in any of that foolishness. This is exactly what I mean. Christopher causes havoc, and then everybody else has to clean up the mess. He wants the family to treat him well, but he refuses to participate in any change that involves himself. Uh, he adds that if the children need an intervention themselves, or if they need to do some real love work, then fine, but they would have to pay for it. So he's willing to pay for anything that gets him what he wants. He's not willing to pay for anything that would bring happiness to anybody else. He lives in his head. You're very sweet to want to try to help your ex-husband because I know that you really do. You're a good person, but that is not going to happen. You've learned after all these years of marriage and after all these years of not being married, this man is never going to change a millimeter but you can love your boys. Parenthetically, to everybody who's listening, she has been loving her boys, and she has been seeing a change, and she is a much happier person now, uh, having learned what unconditional love is, having never learned what it was as a child. That's how she married a completely selfish, narcissistic person like this, and was the object of so much anger as a child and as an adult. But now she's learned that life can be lived differently. And she doesn't have to be ruled by people like this. None of us do. The more love we experience, the greater choices we can make. And that is power. We'll see you in a week.